Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining on us on this much needed and yet not often talked about conversation. Um, just to talk a little bit about the PNYA, we are an organization, for those who have not joined us as a, as a member, we are an organization of freelancers and unions and facilities that work in post-production, everything sound, music, VFX, uh, DI, everything that you can think of that's post-production, we have a community here. Um, but uh, we have subcommittees within the PNYA and today we are the Equity and Inclusion Committee, and we look to diversify and educate members on social issues within our community. We were born from a need for inclusivity. The ENI committee is dedicated to opening up the hiring process and breaking down all barriers of entry into our community. Our primary objective is to increase employment of BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and individuals from underrepresented communities. This takes into account those who are disabled, issues of ageism, and the bias against parents. Um, which brings us to today. We are going to hear some of the best experiences and some of the worst experiences uh, about finding that elusive balance of parenthood and post-production. Um, so guiding us today's conversation is Tanu Sakri. Sorry, Tanu Sakri. Uh, she's currently our first, a first assistant editor on features. She's navigating her recent transition from commercial world, commercial world to scripted content. Um, all the while, while prioritizing her seven-year-old daughter and her family. So let's welcome Tanu. Thank you so much for organizing this much needed panel, Rebecca. It's definitely overdue. <laughs> and I am either very brave or very foolish to talk about balance in an industry where it may very well be held against me. But luckily I'm in very good company here. And I'd like to introduce Marnie Meyer, a New York based editor who's worked on a variety uh, of projects over a decade. Her work includes the Americans, Billions, and more recently, Run the World. She's also a mom to two boys, ages eight and 10. And the next um, uh, person on my pa panel is Lauren Orban. She began her career as a VFX producer in 2015. She has since transitioned to post supervisor and coordinator on several high profile TV shows and films and is currently post-supervising an independent feature. Her kids are two, four, and six. And um, last but not the least, we have Jennifer Lane, who has worked on over 30 features as an associate producer or post-supervisor. Some of her recent credits are as an associate producer on Dear Evan Hansen, Mary Poppins Returns, and Gemini Man. She's currently associate producing Disney's The Little Mermaid and she's a single mom to a six-year-old son. And I have to add, she was incredibly kind and supportive when I had to deal with a personal situation on Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> so let's welcome the panel. Um, and I'm gonna start the discussion by talking about the choice of parenthood, you know, because, um, you know, many of us uh, have the choice and, and we are trying to figure out that does it make more sense to have kids early and then focus on the career, or does it make sense to wait till we're more established? So I'd like to open the floor. Perhaps Jen can mm -hmm. and can talk about her experience. Sure. Or by anyone else who wants to jump in. I um, I became a single mom by choice um, later in what um, I was classified as AMA, Advanced Maternal Age, by my doctors. <laughs> And um, I did my career for 20 years and did, said, I, I want more than this and I want to have a child and I wasn't meeting the right person. So I just did it on my own. And it was a scary decision, but it's the best decision I've ever made. And um, I could go into the details if somebody wants to talk about this in another conversation about how I did it technically, but um, I went through the IVF process and there was a donor and there's a lot that goes into that and a lot of expense, but it was a worthy expense. So I'm very glad I did it. It does take an army to become a parent in general. And um, you have to be flexible and be able to you know, stand up for what you need for your kid. So I was very established in my career when I chose to do it. I thought I couldn't become a parent until I was well established, unlike other people. Thank you, thank you. Can we, uh, is, uh, is anyone on the panel who is less established and then wanted to do it early and talk about that? I, was, um, I, can, 
I can go ahead, go ahead, Lauren. Go ahead. Lauren. <laughs> um, I I came into the industry after a career change, um, and I already had uh, I had already had a child by that point, a very young child. I started working in the industry when they were only um, six months old, um, and it was it was really difficult at first, um, and for you know several years, just because I was working in a uh, I wasn't well established. I was working in um, much lower positions on the totem pole. Um, you know, I wasn't making a ton of money. My first job in the industry basically just covered enough for me to send my one child to daycare with like no take home pay. After that, it was literally just enough to send them to daycare so that I could go learn how to do this job. Um, and then, you know, I was I was lucky enough to have a, a partner who um, did have an established career. He had healthcare benefits that we could all, you know, partake in. Um, without which I don't know that what I did really would have been possible. Um, it would have been really hard starting out making so little money and having a family, you know, to support. Um, so I was lucky that I had, you know, someone in my corner who would like could help me um, in that process. And then, you know, I have three boys, um, two, four and six, and kind of as each one came, it was a, it was a decision like, um, you know, can we afford it? What's happening in my career? Will this be sustainable? Um, you know, and a lot of thought went into each decision. Um, and you know, like I said, I decided to have them all kind of early, just get it out of the way. And now I can, now they're all growing up, but I can also kind of focus on my career a little bit too. Um, so it's different. And do do you have a story to add for us, Marnie? Um, yeah, I was I was assisting when I was pregnant with my first, and I moved up when I had my second. So I've experienced both assisting and editing while pregnant. And I think I would have loved to have not had to be assisting while pregnant, but it was, you know, one of those things where I was like, I don't know if this is ever going to happen to become an editor. So I think I need to just do this, you know, um, but it was a really hard decision because I knew that um, the hours are long when, when you're an assistant and you don't have as much control over your schedule. And it was really, really tough. And we had to find daycare. We actually had to find a daycare that was um, a family daycare where I could come at nine o'clock if needed or 10 o'clock if needed. It was in someone's home. Um, Cause I don't, my husband, and I don't have family nearby. Um, and so she was like a grandmother to my, both my boys, they both went to her um, daycare. And um, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to, cause I wouldn't have been able to do the like, um, you know, you're getting billed extra because you're 10 minutes late, like at a traditional daycare and we couldn't afford a nanny. So it was hard, it was hard. Um, so yeah, I think, it just kind of shows you that like you have to sort of seek out what will work for you in terms of childcare and that there are other possibilities, but it takes a lot more like research and sort of digging in and figuring out like what will work for you. Yeah. Um, I, and you know, I'm wondering that as parents in post, we often fa face unfair discrimination, you know, uh, for example, I know of a very, very experienced assistant editor mom who was not hired for a project but they hired an AE dad with the implicit bias that women are more likely than men to prioritize family over work. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to hear your stories um, uh, with similar situations and uh, also like what's a good way to deal with it, you know? So, I mean, I will say, so I've, I've been in the industry now since about 2015. Um, and during all of that, I've had, I've had my kids and I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of people who have been very supportive and understanding, you know, I don't want this conversation to be all doom and gloom because it does exist that there are plenty of supportive people out there um, and you can find those people. Um, but there have, you know, there have been instances where I've been um, discriminated against because it was apparent, um, you know, I've lost job opportunities. Um, I've, I was offered a contract at one place of employment. And then when they found out that my life was going to be a little bit chaotic because I was a parent, you know, the contract was actually rescinded. Um, and, and, you know, and at the time I couldn't really fight it. I, I wasn't really in a position to do much about it. Um, even though I kind of knew that it was illegal and that kind of thing. Um, 
I ended up staying there for a few months and then just ended up looking for other opportunities. And when a better, you know, better one came along, I took it. Um, but it's really, it's kind of complicated navigating that and advocating for yourself um, and trying to figure out kind of how to make it all work in the workplace. Um, and as much as possible, I think just when it comes to interviewing and sort of selecting the projects that you work on, um, you know, taking into account the people that you're interviewing with, getting a sense of what you think, how they're going to support you in your family life, if they're going to um, be a support for you in that way, um, and just using your best judgment, even just as early as the interview process. So that's kind of how I navigate things now. Um, yeah. Um, I'll go next, because I can also answer this question from Zach Griffin, who asked if there are AE dads breaking in the industry. There are a bunch of AE dads that I know that are I don't know if the question was breaking in the industry or breaking into editorial, um, but it's there are a dads who have young kids who are trying to train. I can think of at least three right this second who are, have young kids who are trying to switch over. They all have partners, um, and I'm sure they work out some balance with their partners on if they have to work late. That's the thing you have to figure out the balance with your partner, and if you are a solo parent. You have to pay for the help usually if your family is not around to help, what, like Marnie said. Um, yeah. It does exist. People do the hours. It's just hard because you have to find the balance of and figure out what you're willing to sacrifice and how much time you're willing to sacrifice for not seeing your kids and, and setting up the lines. As far as the discrimination stuff we were talking about before, someone told me um, a recent story of an assistant who was contacted by a female um, post producer saying, Hey, you got married recently. Any kids? Uh, I've got this job that might be available. And the question is, was she asking if the person had kids to be nice or was she asking if the person had kids to find out if they should put them up for the job? And I want to say, if you're pregnant, you do not, that's a discrimination thing we'll get into later, but you do not have to um, speak to that, but I agree you try to find people to work for who are parents or who are understanding and I agree you can read that in the room. You can read that in an interview if people seem, just because they're a parent, they're not necessarily understanding. Um, so you have to sort of feel it out and do research on that, you know, talk to other people who've worked for those individuals before to find out if they're understanding about, oh, my kid is sick or my partner has to leave town for three days and I'm gonna to have to go home early these three days. You know, you just sort of find that out. You can ask about it in the interview, but you might also want to not and wait yeah. to, because you don't wanna put it out there that you don't want somebody to think, oh, this person's gonna have a problem with their kid all the time. I don't wanna hire them. And uh, to be honest, I'm gonna be very honest. It's like, I have a babysitter who has a child. And when I meet, you know, I have friends in the industry who are about to have a baby, I do make a recommendation to be aware of that, their babysitter's personal obligations. Because if you have to work late and they have a kid waiting at home for them, you know, you just have to think about the, the balance of it. Not that I discriminate, my family has a kid, I don't, but I, it's just something to be aware of, like the knockdown event, if, if you are late, how it affects other people as well. Marnie, do you have anything to oh, add? Yeah, I was just going to say that I've definitely felt like, especially after I had my second child, a lot of pressure from male producers. Oh, how are you going to handle this? You know, you think you got this? And I, I think, you know, going, you know, back to what Jen was saying, like, as I've grown as a parent and an editor, I've really just tried to work with people who see me as a full person and see that I need balance and see that I can absolutely get the job done. I just may need to do it on a different time frame, or I may need to, um, you know, if I need to leave early, I'll catch up. Like it's just creating that like trust and also seeing that whoever I'm working with um, always is understanding and respectful of the fact that I am a parent and that like, I will always need that balance. Um, but that um, I think it's really hard when you're an assistant to fight for that. It's obviously easier when you're an editor, um, but as much as you can advocate for yourself, as much as you can like stand up for yourself and what you need, I think is so critical. 
<clears throat> Definitely standing up for what you need is important. And not being afraid and not being afraid of, of, of that. Um, I want to, I want to give one other example. I think this is a good time to mention it. Um, mm -hmm. I know that on a uh, series, sometimes people work really late just because the showrunner is in the editing room with the editor and there are five people sitting there waiting just in case. Um, I've only done one show and on that show um, that was happening a little bit and there were two other people on my team. One was a mom and one was not. And we start, we created a schedule. It was like, these two nights you're gonna work late, these two nights you're gonna work late. I didn't want the person who wasn't a mom to feel penalized for not having a kid for covering late. And so I wanted it to feel equal. At the same time, I wanted the I wanted to get home to my kid and I wanted the other mom to get home to her kid. And so you have to sort of ask for that. I know as a with assistant editors or people are on the post staff, it's kind of hard to ask the senior person for that. But you have, you have to be brave because you're standing up for your right to be with your parent. And some people are just clueless. They're not going to offer that. It's like people don't usually ask for, offer raises. <laughs> you have to ask yeah. for the raise. No, I so. agree. You have to ask. Um, I think it's really critical. And I think we have to do it. Um, you know, we have to continue to do it so that people can kind of see that, you know, it's it's a need. It's not, you know, yeah, it's kind of essential. I think Thank there's you. a Thank larger, so sorry. sorry, sorry, no, go ahead. I think there's also a larger sort of conversation here too about just sort of the industry and um, quality of life, um, you know, and even if you're not a parent, like people deserve to have a life outside of this industry, um, you know, at, because I'm kind of on the admin side of thing and I'm a parent, I'm always kind of thinking like, who needs to be here? Do we all have to be here? Is there anyone I can let leave? Are they, like, is being remote an option? Like what, what can we do here to just kind of ensure that everyone has a good quality of life? Um, you know, people deserve to have lunch with their friends or dinner with their friends or go to the gym or, you know, do whatever. It's not always either about just being a parent. It's also just kind of being aware of what's going on in your team's lives and respecting them as human beings. You know, we're not just work machines behind a, you know, a system all day. Um, too, which I think is something too important to consider. Yes, and I'm sure all the AEs hearing that are cheering and <laughs> writing you, down your name <laughs> in list of people they want to work with. <laughs> because uh, that's, that's, that attitude is so rare, Lauren. And, and as an AE, I have to say that I, you know, I, I definitely look for that. I look for that in the team, you know, in the editor, in the post super, you know, just, just an attitude of humanity, I would say, you know that just to be kind, just to be, you know, considerate that if someone has something going on, then, you know, it's okay. And, uh, and, uh, you know, it's so interesting as women, we find it so difficult and awkward to ask for rights in an environment that's A, dominated by men and B, there's so little conversation around these topics, right? And, um, you know, and, and, you, and I think I agree with you guys that selecting the right projects and I think finding and hopefully with with more panels like this building a community you know um i think would help change that um and uh, you know I, I personally found like a huge community in uh women in post production that was started by my friend laura creasy who's a new mom and she's on she's attending the panel right now <laughs> And uh, she's amazing. She, she's an editor, she's a director, you know, she's right now being like a VFX editor on a feature and uh, such, such a fantastic advocate for women. And uh, another, another community that I found very helpful was parents in post-production. It's run by Liam Johnson, who's actually a single dad um, in answer to your question, Zach. And I love that Zach is sitting here with his little kid strapped on. <laughs> So, uh, you know, and I want to just say that I want, I want to open it up to everyone uh, who wants to share their experiences. If you want to on the chat, please feel welcome. You know, I, I want this to be a broader conversation. But, you know, I, I want to say that, um, you know, I, I really also enjoyed like Zach Arnold's, uh, 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 you know, uh, podcasts. And uh, he, he proudly says that he has a nine hour workday, 
you know, with like all these productivity hacks and he's a dad and he prioritizes health. And I feel like um, that's so important. And I, and I, I agree. I feel like it's so hard to be a good, uh, you know, uh, uh, like someone who's very uh, good at their work. If you're working 15 hours a day and never seeing your family, you know, or going to the gym or eating healthy. Right. So it's, uh, uh, anyway, and, um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, other ways to, um, make this work. And, and for me personally, work, working from home, uh, although I haven't gotten to do that yet much, I feel like that would be a game changer. I, I'm looking for that if I can for my next project, because I'm commuting one and a half hour each day on this project. And, uh, you know, I, I basically have a 13 hour day and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing my daughter only on, on like on a rare evening or weekends. And, uh, and, and it's hard, you know, but at the same time, I feel like assistants are looking for an opportunity to edit. And sometimes learning and creative collaboration is not as seamless working remotely, you know, and, uh, and, and, and also there seems there needs to be so much trust between team members when you're working remotely, right? Um, so I want to talk more about that, like, because I'm sure, you know, and it's, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, of course, it's probably a little easier for, you know, a coordinator or a supervisor to work from home, but harder for an assistant. So, um, but I want to talk more about that as well. And, you know, hopefully it's not like a never ending remote versus hybrid, <laughs> hybrid versus in person uh, debate. But like, luckily, I feel that it's, it's an option now. And I want to talk more about how that's changed the work life balance for you guys. Can I chime in? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's completely changed my life for the better. Um, I would say it was very, very hard when both of my boys were home. Um, even though we chose hybrid learning last year, it, it was very infrequent because there were so many cases at their schools. Um, so it was really tough. My husband had to take a whole year off of work so that he could manage them um, with school because, you know, you can't put a five-year-old in front of a computer. <laughs> It was uh, absurd, um, but so he basically, he also works in the industry. And so he took the whole year off to be with them and help them. And then I closed the door and worked in our office and luckily had a third room, you know, to do that. Um, and it was tough, but I could still have dinner with my kids every night. I could see them throughout the day. Um, and I've been working remotely for a year and a half now. And um, I would like to keep doing this. <laughs> I don't mind going in when needed, but um, this has been such a better way of life for me. Um, I see my kids more and I feel like I can just be more a part of their lives. And I am just not as like frazzled, like pre-pandemic parenthood for me was unsustainable. It was very hard. Um, and I feel like this is much better. Um, so I hope that even if we're, you know, asked to come back into offices, I just hope that we've obviously proven that we can do this from um, home. And so I just hope that there's just more of a flexibility and just a, you know, honoring that like we obviously can get the work done. So we should do what works for the project and also us like it should be both thank you i agree i'll say something um as a supervisor um yeah it's easier for supervisors and coordinators to work wherever because all you need is a phone really and i definitely uh i come to the office every day but i definitely take some mornings to do whatever to take my kid to school. And then I take care of myself and some stuff at home. And then I come to work and I'll make up hours after he goes to bed or on the weekends. So there's definitely more flexibility for people in my position and Lauren's position and maybe visual effect coordinators. It is good to be in the office, but I can definitely be done at home. I don't have a th third room. I would love one. When my son is home, I cannot get anything done, even with the babysitter. So <laughs> I was going around the corner to my aunt's house and working out of her dining room in the afternoons before we were back in person. Um, so it's, it is about finding the balance for assistant editors. 
I worked with Tanya and Tanya had a system at home and she took a drive at home. I trusted that she would be safe with the material. And I was like, great. She has, you know, she had a situation where she needed to be home more often for a week or two. And so she took the drive, she did her work when she could. And we were just understanding and she was very communicative of what she could get done when. And it was okay because we were just prepared and we understood the situation. And so I think, I don't know how expensive systems are, but if you have that option to work at home, if you have an option to do hybrid, it does give you that those moments, you save that commuting time and you just, you do get to see your child more and it is more satisfying because you don't want to just see your kid for half an hour in the morning and then you come home and they're asleep. You don't want to miss their childhood and only see it on the weekends. You want to really have a, be a part of it every day. So anything you can do to maintain that throughout the week is very, very important. How about you, Lauren? I mean, I totally agree. I mean, I feel like if um, there's sort of has been one positive over the last, you know, two years of living in pandemic life for all of us, it's like Marnie said, it's proven that we can be adaptable and flexible that, you know, the possibilities are there um, working from home and that it, it doesn't always have to be expensive. Like there are plenty of remote in desktop, like jump licenses that you can get um, and things like that, that shouldn't be too costly for your production. And, and that, enable it to make it possible for people to have a lot more flexibility in their lives. And um, I mean, again, I think on the admin side, as much as we can do to support, you know, all of our editors and AEs and that as much as possible, like I'm all for it. Um, and I just want, you know, I like at the end of the day, like we all want our teams to be happy, um, you know, cause when happy people do better work. <laughs> um, so anyway, so yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm hoping that um, the industry is kind of experiencing a shift right now to making this remote possibility a little bit more normalized. Um, that's my hope that, you know, if there's anything positive that comes out of this, that it's that. Yes, as, as like most parents, I'm sure. Not all. I know that some parents find it really hard to kind of like, you know, work in an apartment with like a two-year-old running around. Sometimes but, it's yeah. nice to escape them. Just <laughs> be totally honest. <laughs> I kicked them all out of the house for this meeting. I was like, nope. <laughs> yes, I agree. I think, and, and I think that's why hybrid is like a great option because then you can kind of go in and coll collaborate when you need to, and then you can, you know, uh, have the balance mm -hmm. at other times. If, if you're unable to do hybrid though, just to speak to that for a second, um, and your kid is too young to go to a daycare or um, is too young to go to any school um, there are, uh, or an official preschool. There are daycares, there are family situations like what Marnie talked about. You could do a nanny share also. There are nann nannies that take care of two kids at a time. There are some ways about it. And I would talk to other parents about what they did for childcare for young parents also all those um, associations we put in the chat, like lean on parent groups to ask questions like that or go search through their history. It's amazing what people will share about how they handled certain situations. And you, you learn so much from other parents and people are actually really helpful. The parent, Park Slope Parent Association is a little crazy, but they have like a 70 page guide on how best to hire a nanny. And, and so I read it and it was very helpful <laughs> about what to do and payroll and workers comp and all that kind of stuff. So there, there is research out there that helps you kind of figure out the balance. Yeah, uptown yeah, there I, are a lot of um, family daycares. So it's, you know, parents uh, or um, providers offering it out of their homes. And that's a very affordable way for childcare in, in the city. Um, ours was like a brownstone and she had the basement she had the whole, whole whole home, but she used the basement for the daycare and she had, you know, maybe eight kids at the max. You can only have two little ones. Like, so that's a really good option for like more affordable daycare in the city. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's so helpful. I, I know, so I know it's harder in the city to have like the space for an au pair, but I have a friend of mine who's an editor and she, uh, happens to have like a two bedroom. So she has an au pair. She's a single mom too. Um, 
so um, so yeah, so there are like so many options. And Jen, I would love to read that 70 page document. <laughs> I'm still so bad at the whole babysitter thing. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I want to talk about the laws, protections, and I, I'm not sure like, um, you know, uh, who uh, can speak to it. I'm sure, I, I feel like Jen, you have a lot of experience with that, but Lauren, Marnie, please, you know, chime in. But I want to talk about the New York Family Leave Act, short-term disability. I feel like, you know, especially if someone uh, who's pregnant right now and is trying to figure out how much time they can take off and things like that, um, I would love to talk about, uh, you know, resources and laws. I can start. So I just put the Pregnancy Discrimination Act law in the chat. Um, I guess if people are seeing this later, hopefully there'll be a list of all these resources available at the end of the podcast. Um, it's absolutely, a, you, you can't ask someone if you're pregnant. Um, uh, actually, I wrote down, not illegal to be asked. Um, are you pregnant? What do you do if you're asked in a job interview? So there's also this Forbes magazine not illegal to be asked, you do not legally have to disclose the information. So I would not share it. If you're pregnant and you're trying to get a job, I wouldn't share it. You can walk into an interview, eight months pregnant, and you don't have to say a word about it. So I would, I would not. I understand like it's hard to, you know, if you have this form, you know, if you're five months pregnant and you're looking for a job, and, but you know you have to leave and you're not going to be able to stay on the whole time. It just depends on your relationship with the people if you tell people or not. I mean, a lot of shows lose crew halfway through and then they replace them. It is possible with warning. If you choose not to say anything, I would certainly give as much notice as you can once you've started. Um, I, when I was pregnant, I, I, I had gotten a job and I didn't know I was gonna get pregnant and I got pregnant on the job. I didn't say anything, I didn't say anything. And as movies go, it goes on and on and on and on and on. And at some point, the delivery date of the movie surpassed my pregnancy date, so I had to replace myself. And when I told my post exec, he goes, was that planned? I was like, wow, that's just not something you ask. So um, it doesn't, you do not need to disclose it. I wouldn't disclose it. And, um, but I would just be cognizant of what the, the delivery dates are and be honest once you've started the job. Um, the other stuff is there's a pregnancy disability, which I know Lauren can talk to about more than I can, because um, I didn't do it, but I think Lauren got it. There are two things. So there's a Family Leave Act, which did not exist until a few years ago, the Paid Family Leave Act. And you can get up to um, $1,068 a week for 12 weeks. You just, the problem is you have to have been employed by the company for 26 consecutive weeks. So if you start a job and you're on it for a month and then go have a baby, you're not gonna get it. Um, so that is the only problem with that. I did, you could also, if you don't meet that qualification, you could do unemployment. Um, also hard to use, yes, right. If you only work on, on a four month gig and you don't make that 26 weeks, but if you're close to the 26 weeks and you're just short two weeks, talk to your employer. Just talk to them and say, look, I, you know I'm having a baby, you know I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna work, I'm two weeks shy of getting the family leave back. Is there anything we can work out? I'm happy to, you know, so you're asking to get paid two weeks longer, but maybe there's something you can work out with them or maybe they'll just give it to you because they're nice. You know, you just don't know what people are going to do. I know many post supers have extended people if they're short one week for their hours, they will find a way to extend them for a week so they can get their hours for the next six months. Um, so the pay family leave act pays 12 months, uh, 12 weeks. The short term disability for pregnancy leave is only $170 a week paid by the employer, and the employer has to keep your job available for you. But Lauren, you know a little more about the Disability Act than I do. Yeah, so I got, um, I was working on a show where I was hired. Um, I did not disclose that I was pregnant at the beginning because <laughs> originally when I took the job, the show was supposed to be done several weeks before I was due. So I took the job thinking, oh, I'll get a whole season of a show under my belt. And then of course, you know, the delivery date on that show kept pushing and pushing, whereas my delivery date did not change. 
Um, <laughs> so I, what I also ended, what also ended up happening on that show was I, I think I worked for something like two or three weeks and then I had already a, a planned week long vacation or something like that. So I took my vacation, came back. Um, then I found out about this 26 week, you know, mile marker. Um, I ended up just making the cutoff um, for the 26 weeks so that I qualified for short term, uh, short term disability on that show. And I was lucky because they started counting it after my vacation, because even though I had worked for them three weeks prior and then went on vacation and then finished out my 27 weeks or whatever it was, they started counting it from after my vacation because technically I wasn't employed for that week, which is we all know is a load of baloney. Um, so anyway, so it, to Jen's point, you know, if you find yourself in a situation like that, you know, you can, there are ways that you can advocate for yourself. You can go to, um, they could have retroactively paid me for that week. Like they could have come up with a solution to help me out. Um, I was fortunate that I didn't need to go down that path, but, um, yeah, that was a concern. Um, so I was on a show for 27 weeks. I didn't get it, the uh, short-term disability. In terms of the Family Leave Act, um, they phased that in over a period of, I don't know, six to eight years or something like that. Now it's up to 12 weeks. It used to be with my first kid, I think I got six weeks. With my next one, I got eight. And then with my last one, I got 10. Like I never actually got the full benefit. But now the full benefit, I believe, has fully phased in. It, it is the full 12 weeks. Um, and you can get both. Um, some people think that you can only get one or the other. You can get both. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think that's all I really have to say about that. Um, Catherine Cates had a question about, um, whether or not to hide your pregnancies. Um, and I mean, I know we've already talked about it a little bit, but, um, like in my case, I've kind of done both. So with my second, with my second kid, um, I was employed at that company where they had rescinded my contract. So I was already looking for a new thing. So when I, um, went to a new company. They hired me on a, uh, like a trial basis for about three months. I knew that I was pregnant. They didn't know that I was pregnant. And toward the end of it, I, you know, when I was asking like, am, are you going to bring me on full-time or not? I did disclose to them that I was pregnant. I could kind of tell that they were a good group of people. And I felt like I sort of owed them, them that explanation. I think that's just kind of in my personality. You don't actually owe anyone anything. <laughs> you don't have to tell them. But I felt like it, in my case, it was the right thing to do. Um, but then fast forward two years and on that show, on the other show that I got hired for, I didn't tell them um, just because I didn't know those people as well. Um, and that was kind of me being a little bit more cautious. So I think in the end, um, the important thing for you to know is that you're not legally required to say anything, um, but you can sort of use your best judgment and you know, you can decide how much you want to disclose. Um, that's totally up to you. Also, some people are really superstitious, like then they and they don't want to share, or maybe they've had a hard time getting pregnant, or who knows, or it's a maybe you're a single parent, you don't know how to share that information with people. Like you just you have to trust your your comfort level. But yeah, it's very important to know it's not legally. You don't need and you don't need to disclose if somebody asks you. You don't need to disclose it at all. And one other thing I want to say that I did, I, I also complicated, but I'm also in the editor's guild and I have, you, you know, you can, um, I get my motion picture help and benefits, like not through the union though. And you have to make a certain number of hours every six months. And I was planning to, and I took off five months and I wanted to make sure my hours would carry over. I contacted them and told them when I had a baby and they shifted what the six month period was. They were, MPI was very understanding. They shifted what my six month window was and made it like an eight hour, eight month window or something like that. So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't be penalized for having a kid and then losing hours because it wasn't crossing the six month mark. I don't think that's information anywhere you can find on a MPI site. I just called them and they were very understanding. That's, that's really so great to hear. I took yeah. unemployment. So if you have trouble with any of the other things, I was able, I mean, because I had my kids, you know, eight and 10 years ago. Um, and I had a very sweet accountant that just said to me, you can totally go on unemployment. I had not even considered it. And so I did it for both children and it worked. It was fine. You know, so if you have trouble with the other options, like it is an option. The I other did it too. Paid more, obviously, but it, it, it was helpful. It was something. 
I just want to say one other thing about the short-term disability as well, which is, um, you know, Jennifer was mentioning that she has MPI benefits as a post super. Me as a post coordinator, I don't qualify for MPI benefits at all. So, um, and again, I was lucky because I have a partner that I've always just popped onto his health insurance ha as have all of our kids. Um, but in order to take advantage of the short-term disability, you don't have to buy into your employer's um, healthcare coverage. Um, like I, I think I had the option if I wanted to pay extra to add on healthcare as part of mine, but it wasn't MPI benefits and I elected not to, and yet I still was able to tap into the short-term disability through the employer. Um, so like Marnie said, just talk to the accountants, talk to whoever, like, you know, and they can help you suss out all of those details. Get your money. I also wanted to talk about when someone goes on maternity and paternity leave. Um, you know, I wanted to say it's not such a ter terrible thing. And I, I would love to hear about, uh, you know, I feel like, I feel like it's, um, you know, especially from the point of view of people who are hiring, like perhaps, you know, Laura and Jen, and even, even Marnie, I feel like if you were to hire someone who you knew was pregnant and had to be replaced, right? Would you hire them? Yes, no, why? And like, you know, how would like, I feel like, you know, are there opportunities out there for other people to move up? And can we talk about that? Because it's always seen as such a bad thing, but is there a positive side to it? Well, I would absolutely work with someone um, for just a simple fact, like you choose the people you like working with. And that's just, you know, if they're pregnant, they're pregnant and you'll find someone, you'll find somebody great to replace them. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I like working with, you know, other women who may or may not be parents. I like, you know, also sort of looking out for other women who may be in the same situation as I was in. And when I was an assistant and pregnant, I only worked with men and it was really tough. And even though they were kind editors, they didn't get it. Like they didn't understand. So I always sort of want to pay it forward in that way. Like if I can, because it wasn't as, easy as it could have been for me in the beginning. So I feel like, yes, <laughs> but you know, I'm not sure that that's, you know, the take on for everyone, but. I, what I think you, Jen? Yeah, I think most, I think women are more understanding to hire women who are pregnant. Mm -hmm. I, um, not to do any male bashing, but, um, I would definitely hire someone who's pregnant. Absolutely, it wouldn't change my mind about it at all. If they hid it for me and I found it later, I'd be like, oh, okay, I, I totally understand. Um, I think that uh, on the reverse, like we don't necessarily know if a man is about to be expecting a baby. Like I think that <laughs> men should um, feel comfortable not saying it, but should also be asking for paternity leave or time off like the industry doesn't give maternity paternity leave, but ask for time off from the job and be like, look, I want to go be home for this week. My, my kid is born. And I think we, I had that on a show. Rebecca, didn't we have that with on, on, on Gemini? Thank you on Gemini, man. And we had somebody sort of standing by like who was editing their own thing, but was willing to come in for a week whenever that happened in a month. Like you just sort of, you plan for it as much as you, as you can. I can't remember now. And, and you just, you know, you, you're like, oh, well, the, you know, dads deserve to be home with their kids too. And so you just try to plan it out as best you can find someone who can come in and jump in the replacement or lean on the crew or the, um, you know, it gives an opportunity for somebody to move up the ladder if they are, if you're pregnant and don't come back to the show, it gives maybe a chance for the PA to step up to ERA and the ERA to step up to assistant editor. And I know it's a little questionable with the, the editor's guild is doesn't like when people switch positions mid job but I feel like when it's someone who is pregnant who's leaving the job and everyone else getting a chance to move up together they are more understanding about it instead of us announcing like the last week of a show my PA is going to be the ERA for a week that they're not so understanding about but I feel like it creates great opportunities for people and I want to talk about you know I, I feel like we're almost um you know, out of time, like, but the, before we go, I feel like, um, you know, I want to talk about 
superpowers, like parent superpowers. I feel like being a parent has really changed me. You know, I feel like it's, uh, you know, it, it's really helped me become, you know, way more uh, calm under pressure. And, and, and you know, uh, this, this industry is a lot of pressure. I feel like it's made me way more organized because I feel like as a mom trying to juggle work full time, you have to be organized, you know, and um, and and I'm and I would love to hear, you know, uh, everyone's parent superpowers. What 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 do you think? Being a parent, you know, I feel like we always talk about, oh, you know, this is difficult and A and B, but what you know, how has it made you better at your job? And uh, you know, and then perhaps end with some inspiring stories. I think it's made me a most a master at multitasking. And also very much like I have to get this done so that I can do X, Y, Z later in the day. Like there is definitely a drive because there's so much that you need to get done in our work plus parenting. So it, it definitely keeps me very much like focused and also multitasking all the time. <laughs> so that would be maybe my superpower. Um, I think ultimately and for me, or, the, uh, the or. word is um, flexibility, um, being able to like oh. shift constantly from, um, from home to work, you know, even mentally and or physically, because um, it's as much of a mental game as it is, you know, physically where you are. Um, Jen and I were joking about this beforehand, like all the different hats that we have to wear, um, you know, and just constantly kind of be juggling things. So I think being flexible, I think, uh, allowing yourself a little bit of grace and like to not always feel like you have to be perfect at everything, um, figuring out, um, as moms, especially like, what are my biggest priorities right now? You learn how to sort of prioritize, um, you know, and sometimes it's like, family absolutely has to come first. Sometimes the job absolutely has to come first and you become sort of the master at navigating those sort of hurdles and uh, using your judgment. So um, I think just being able to be flexible <laughs> more than anything, um, it's kind of how I handle it. Well, I don't know if this is a superpower, but perspective has certainly changed as a parent. Um, what is important, what isn't important and what you fret over and not fret over. Like it's just your perspective is, it's a high stress job, but it is not, it's not brain surgery and it is not, you know, it's a movie or a TV show and no matter what family comes first, especially, I think the whole industry is learning that from COVID and being stuck at home with your families and just, you know, people getting sick, the priority has to be your family. And there, were, there are people that will not put family first and then you just don't work with them again, hopefully. Um, the perspective of what's important and um, uh, my superpower is running on empty because I was joking on that earlier. Just there have definitely been times when it's like I just have too much to do and I just work late and then I get up early the next day and just finding the, the energy and the strength to um, get it all done. It's sometimes it is quite challenging at times, but it's but I, 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 I just make decisions faster. I don't fret over them as much. I'm like, well, what's the best thing to do? And we'll just do it. And you just focus and you get it done and then you move on to the next task. I guess. I highly recommend being a parent. <laughs> it is a great gift. It really is. I do want to say something about that. Um, like I became a parent later in life, you know, as I said, AMA. And um, it's the greatest gift. And I'm so grateful that I live in a time when I could become a parent on my own. Um, it's, it's just challenging in general to be a parent, but if you want to be a parent, don't, uh, you know, try to figure out a way to, to become a parent, whether it's on your own or with a partner. Like if you wait too long established in your career, you may have a hard time getting pregnant. Now, I know people who are in their twenties who have had to do IVF in order to get pregnant. And I know people in their forties who got pregnant on a one night stand, not me, but some other <laughs> else I know. But um, I just think it's, it's, it's an important thing if you want that in your life to make sure you find a way to make it happen because it is a great gift. And at some point it does become impossible for you to do it like the older you get. 
Yeah, to that point, it's going to be hard no matter when you do it. <laughs> so right. like, it's just going to be hard and it's going to be hard. You're going to have to make hard choices. You're going to have to make compromises. You're going to have to, um, you're going to be tired no matter when you do it. So yes. But we all, but we all like to say that if you can deal with a tantruming two-year-old, that you can deal with a tantruming showrunner. So, <laughs> for sure, sometimes verbal skills for sure from parenthood <laughs> to our line of work. Um, somebody had a question in the chat about working late at facilities. So uh, Naomi did, and I just want to try to address that before we break up. Um, <clears throat> a lot of post-production happens at the end of the day, evening, often things get kicked off at 6 p.m. due to client requests. I'm curious how, oh, I um, can't seem to scroll down. I am curious now that people are going back to the office um, and staying at facilities. There's an expectation for people to stay late on a legal note. Co uh, um, employers contracts often say the hours are nine to six, but expected people to stay late. I think that you try to, hopefully you have a team where you can tag team and uh, one person stays late one night, another person stays late another night. Hopefully you are not obligated to stay night, late every single night. Otherwise, I, you know, it's hard if you're the only assistant editor, you're the only supervisor, um, you just have to stand up for yourself and say, I cannot stay late for three weeks straight. I will not see my child. Like, I just think there are some employers that will be understanding about it and some will not be. And you just have to stand up for yourself. Um, I agree to that 100%. Also that there's so much work right now. Like, I feel like we're finally in a place where we can make choices. And so like, if you are in a situation where it's not compatible with your, with your life, then maybe there's a different job, right? Like, I just feel like we have to start advocating for what we need. Absolutely. And it's hard with the remote world. There are showrunners that are in LA. They do expect to work on LA hours. And when you're taking a job, you, you should ask that. Where are the showrunners located? Where's the director located? What are the hour expectations? You know, and it's something to be cognizant. Oh, somebody just told me the other day that Spike Lee watches his dailies at 6 a.m. every day with his crew. It seems quite so early. Early. And, and that is, you know, so I hope that's no, something else. That that like, if you can research, if you can ask questions of friends who've worked for the same producers or editors or whatever, like, sort of find out, like, what is their, you know, worth ethic? Like, do they start? I, I worked on a show where they, the producers wanted, they would come into my room at seven o'clock at night to start doing notes. And I was like, I can't do this every night. I want to see my kids, you know? So, um, you know, and you don't always know that when you start a job, you just don't. It, sometimes you find it out on the job, but maybe there are people you can inquire with, hey, what, what is their style? Do they do that? You know, and maybe it's just easier to find it out from, you know, other people who've worked for the same producers than to like ask it on an interview. Like it's kind of impossible to ask that kind of thing on an interview. On the admin side, it's a little bit weird because like we're not protected by a union. So asking for OT and things like that is a little bit trickier. Um, I have gotten OT on certain shows and then I've had other people tell me like, you as a post coordinator, you got OT. I never get OT. Um, and so one sort of rule that I've given myself whenever I do request it is like, am I working late right now because I was unavailable during the day for a few hours and I'm just kind of making up things that I need to do on my own time? Or am I doing this because someone has asked me to, like, you know, one of my superiors has asked me to do it. And, you know, typically if it's something that I'm just doing on my own, I don't put in a request for it. But if it's something that someone has asked me to stay late for, um, then I'll try to put in for it and see what I can get. So, um, you know, if you're not protected by contracted hours, um, that's just kind of a rule that I've given myself and it seems to be helpful if that helps any of you. I, I also had a question from uh, one of my uh, uh, friends, Laura Creasy, who's uh, has a nine month old baby and she hasn't slept, you know, in ages as we can all, all relate to, you know, and, and again, like we all as moms know that the baby brain is so real, right? 
and uh, she's working a very full 50 hour week. And, and her question is, how have others who've made it through this stage dealt with coworkers who, who are not as understanding about micro mistakes that you may be making due to lack of sleep? Do you have any, um, you know, advice? <laughs> I might not have advice, but I'm very empathetic because <laughs> I definitely feel like my first few jobs of having a small baby, I did not have the most understanding producer to work under. So, um, and I didn't feel like I, not, after I said the thing earlier, it, it, see, it doesn't always feel like there's another job for you. And I get that. So like, I guess if it's not fitting your needs, like know that there are other jobs out there, like that there are other work possibilities that we don't have to always work in these like crazy situations. Um, but it doesn't feel like that when you're in the middle of it. And it certainly doesn't feel like that when you're, we just, when you've just had a baby and you're really, really, you know, sleep deprived and all of that. Um, so I'm very empathetic to that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess just, keep advocating for yourself as best you can. Yeah, and explain to the coworkers if they have no clue, be like, you know what, baby brain, like we make jokes is, is actually a real thing. Like my, I have a little kid, it wakes, he, she wakes me up every three hours and I am doing the best that I can, like completing my job and being a full mom. So, you know what, too bad. <laughs> can deal with your little mistakes like I just think that it's you know hopefully they understand obviously don't say that to them but I just think you know just say well I'm sorry if I made a mistake I'm a little tired this is why I'm tired I'm taking yeah. care of another being and uh but I'm here doing my job as best I can also everybody makes mistakes like yeah also just acknowledge that like yes you're probably very self-conscious because um, you did just have a baby, but also everybody makes mistakes and like, you know, just try not to like take all of that in and realize that like we're all human, even. Can I, oh, can I say one thing about having a small kid at work? Like um, legally, your job has to provide you a place if you are nursing. We haven't talked about this, a minor thing, but legally um, you shouldn't feel shame for um, pumping at work if you are nursing and they have to provide you with a room to do it. And if you, I mean, in the state of COVID, everybody has their own room pretty much, but when it doesn't happen, like they have to give you a room in which to do it in and provide you with a refrigerator. And to a, be honest, a room um, that's not a bathroom, <laughs> a room that is not a bathroom that has a door that locks and it is actually legal. They have to do that. And to be honest, the facility I was in, I just asked the facility if they had a fridge. They're like, oh, sure. Oh, we don't have one, but we'll buy you one. No problem. It's not the facility's responsibility, but the, you know, it's, it's a legal thing. And you do not feel embarrassed about that and just tell them the schedule. And I mean, I was at a color session with um, someone and I warned the director and the DP. I said, at some point we have to take two <laughs> breaks because this is what has to happen. And when I, when it was time, like the timer texted me and I was like, okay, we have to take a break in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. Like they're just, people are just clueless. Like you just have to stand up for yourself. And if you get interrupted, you're like, okay, I'll take the sign down. I'll go do what I have to do. And then I'll come back and finish that in 20 minutes. You know, you just have to stand up for yourself for that. Cause that's an important thing. And if you want to have that, uh, if you want to do that with your child, like, you do have to stick to a schedule and you, otherwise it really gets messed up and it really hurts. <laughs> I have to sign off because I have to go get my kids. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Marnie. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Everyone. Thank you so much really for being helpful. here, Marnie. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope everybody, I hope it was helpful. So bye. Thank bye, you. Marnie. You, bye. bye, Marnie. Becca, can the rest of us stay on if there oh, are yeah, any absolutely. more questions? Absolutely. Okay, we're so going to keep it open if, for uh, questions here, and then we're going to break out into networking uh, rooms if anyone is okay. available. So yeah. for how long uh, How long are questions allowed? It's 501. How, how much more time for questions? 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay. All right. So, so and, and, and I'm guessing you guys, if anyone has questions, please post them in the chat. I'm going to just read them out in order. And the next question is from Lisa Dason. The question is, what are the organizations and or people who are working to implement steps to make things like family leave standard in the industry?
but also providing spaces for lactation or childcare help. And I, I mean, I, I don't know about organizations, but you know, I had like I had read a fantastic article about uh, Shonda Rhimes, who uh, you know uh, I, I greatly admire, and she's a mom of three, and and she actually said it's a ridiculous idea to pretend that everyone is childless and that childcare is free and simple and easy to get. And I'm posting that article in the chat. But basically, she she tried to get you know uh, 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 childcare on on her shows, you know, and she's incredibly supportive. But uh, I would love to hear stories, you know, from you guys or 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 if if you you know Jen and Lauren, if you know of organizations who are doing this. I, I don't know specific organizations that are trying to implement this. Like I don't know how to be honest. I don't know know how the family leave act came to be in new york when i was my kids six so six years ago they didn't have it in new york but they had it in california and i was upset about it but i i don't know what the who was who pushed to make it happen um so i'm sorry i don't know that the person asking the question if you weren't um on at the beginning of the call there are a lot of links that were added in the in the chat that will be available at the end of the podcast of different like parenting groups um, and some legal links that might provide some information, but I don't know specific specific groups, but you should legally, you know, there are ways to look up your, your legal rights as a parent at work. Oh, you missed those links. Okay, we'll just try to re cut and paste well, them. Yeah. What? Um, but uh, there are, um, Legally, you know, there's the Pregnancy Discrimination Act you can look up and there are, you could just probably type in, you know, parenting rights at work. You know, there are certain things that you have to be allowed to get and you may just have to do some some research about that, but I'll try to re cut and paste some of the links. I think I think we'll also post the links when we post this uh, the, the in the notes when we post this online. So Misa, hopefully you can grab them from there as well. Are, are they, <laughs> any other questions? All right. Well, in that case, we'll open it up to that. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. If you're going to stick around, we'll do breakout rooms. We'll give it a minute for people to stay or leave. Uh, but we really appreciate this. This is something that is it's a very important topic, and it's something that people have been asking questions and a lot of us don't know the answer. So I think this is something that we definitely had to have a conversation. We have this recording that's gonna be on the website. Um, so for those who were not able to make it or if you were late, were late to the meeting, you can always uh, listen to that. Um, but this is a very important topic. And for those of us who are thinking about the future, it's something that we definitely appreciate this. So thank you.